Welcome to the Startup Grind. There are a lot of ways to approach entrepreneurship. A lot of people have an idea and they get really excited about that idea and they look around the world around them to see if they can find someone else that will help them make it happen, right? Um, sometimes the entrepreneur focuses inward and looks at what they can do to make that happen. Um, who you're going to meet tonight, Spencer, he not only had a corporate day job, didn't let that stop him from creating something that he saw a need for, but he also really kind of just got scrappy with it and figured out how to build what is actually a hardware startup where there are hard costs without having to really like look around and figure out which investor was going to pay for it from the beginning. And that's something that, you know, there's no right and there's no wrong, but I just give a little extra props to the people that figure out that first phase themselves and are really able to pull that together and make that happen because that's not easy to do, especially when you have a family and all of these things um, that you have to consider along the way. His wife is here too, by the way. She's in the back. She's super cool. So anyhow, um, I, I'm really proud of what they've done and they've done a lot to here in the community to be able to really engage and it has paid off for them in some really, really cool ways. So I'm excited for him to be able to tell you about these things. So in true startup grind fashion, get up on your feet and join me in welcoming Spencer Thomason of Clean Router. All right. So at Startup Grind, we like to talk a little bit about the person behind the business before we talk about the business itself. Okay. So we're going to get to know Spencer a little bit, all right? All right. So tell us, where did you come from? Um, Family, I, life, whatever. I grew up in Spokane, Washington. I was number seven of ten kids. Um, so I guess that probably came along with some of that uh, having to figure it out. Um, <laughs> but uh, I um, grew up and served a mission for my church, and then after that moved to Arizona. And uh, that's kind of how I landed here. Crazy. I actually was in Spokane for like huh? a lot of years. Awesome. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So um, when, when you were young, what, what were your interests or what were your hobbies or what kinds of things were you engaged in as a youth? Honestly, the two ends of the spectrum. I spent a lot of time outside and then I spent a lot of time hacking on electronical things. It didn't matter what it was. It was taking it apart. It was figuring out how it worked. It was... I learned to program in basic when I was 10, um, so yeah. Okay. Kind of both ends of the spectrum. All right, and then what did you choose to study in college? Originally, when I started in college, I started as a business degree, and then, um, actually, originally, when I originally started, I started as an English degree, did that for about a year, and then after my mission switched to a business degree, and then I was like, these computer guys are making a bunch of money and I know how to code, so this is kind of silly. So I actually switched to a computer science degree. Very good, very good. And did you find that to be an easy transition or did you find it to be a natural fit when you got into coding? Or so at first, you, had to force? you know, then they didn't, when I started, they didn't have Google. I mean, Google came out actually while I was in college and it really, um, so like you had three or four books. So when you had to learn how to program, it was like, I had three books to learn and I would read the same code snippets over and over and over again. And oh. um, I had learned to code in way earlier and kind of took a sabbatical from computers for a year, few years. And so when I came at it, it really just came down to a lot of persistence and figuring out a lot of really late nights. And at that point that I'd gone back to school, I already had um, one, one child with another one on the way. Halfway through school, we bought a house, which Nobody should do. Don't try to buy a house while you go to school. <laughs> Anyways, um, but it just came down to just determination to figure it out. I was working full time at SRP at the time. Um, they were really supportive because they like people learning to program. So, but it took a lot of work to persist through that. What kind of things did you practice coding on? Like, what kind of things did you build for fun? Well, one of the fun, one of the cool things that I got lucky about was I was actually working as a, a phone support guy. When you call up and complain about your SRP bill, I was actually one of those people, <laughs> and I was just taking calls. Um, when I started back to school to do development and they found out they had a developer sitting on the phone so they actually took me out of the call center and said start writing code for us we need this this and this for the call center so uh, one of my favorite things was all the times when when uh, professors at school would be like well in the real world and I'm like I'd raise my hand and be like actually it's not really how you that goes in the real world <laughs> but anyways um, yeah so That's it was funny. it was fun to get to learn and then be putting stuff right into practical use right away okay and I guess just um, back to the setting, like what, what did your parents do um, 
So my mom was really big on learning. Um, she taught me very early on. She literally just dropped me off at the library and said, "You're gonna. I want you to go do a research project on this subject. And she taught me how to do research. Again, at the time, there wasn't Google, so you had to dig through 50 books in the Doing library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not even that, just dig through books. You had to read a ton and really learn a lot to be able to get these research projects that my mom would ask me to do. Um, and I submitted a couple of publications to get written, just small little journals and different things. And I mean, nothing fancy, but just little, little journals. And um, submitted a couple of those with that. So I would say early on that persistence and learning to research has paid off throughout all my years later. Um, my dad was also the kind of person that we never hired anybody to fix something. If we were gonna fix something in the house, he was, he early on taught me, look, if somebody else can learn how this works, you can too. And we would sit down from fixing solar panels on our roof to fixing the heater, to fixing, to building stuff, wow. whatever it was, we just figured it out. Very cool. All right, so then tell us a little bit about your career. Um, so it kind of started in the, you know, at SRP. Um, I, they were really good and I got to go through school. So it was nice because I, I would, use, most of my career at the beginning going through school was, I'd go to work at SRP in the morning. I'd run across the river here really, or across Tempe Town Lake really quick, park my motorcycle right next to class, go into class for two or three hours then go back and work the second half of my shift at SRP. And it worked out good because they were paying me not like a developer and I was getting to have a flexible schedule. So I did that to get through school. And then actually my business partner now um, hired me as my manager and lured me away from SRP. Um, and I worked for University of Phoenix then for a while. So, and then he and I ended up following each other around different jobs throughout all of the years um, when we were actually laid off at, at a company that then led to us starting Clean Router. Okay, very good. So then tell us a little bit about the impetus for Clean Router. So we uh, had actually just gotten laid off together in the beginning of 2009. Um, we, the company was bleeding. They got us to where this product shipped and a week before it shipped, they laid off three of the five developers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of, both of us picked up different contract jobs. Um, we were at varying different kind of places and um, we came up with the idea through a series of events and uh, originally it was kind of funny because both of us were .NET developers and so we actually looked into trying to put .NET onto a router and we we're like this isn't gonna work it's a, <laughs> this is fitting a square peg into a round hole and we said well, we're gonna have to learn how to develop in Linux and we originally kind of built a prototype off of a bunch of off-the-shelf parts um, the original router that we started to work on um, was actually 33 megahertz, which is like crazy slow, Had didn't have enough um, ROM on it, so we were soldering an SD, I actually soldered an SD card onto the old WRT54G, give it enough swap space to be able to boot up the program, and, the very, and it took us about, what was it, three or four months to even get it to that point and to figure out how to do that. And we actually got it to where one thing was running. It filtered a page and crashed. We said, woohoo, works. Let's build this thing. So let's, let's take a step back. What does Clean Router do? So tell people a little bit about the company in its current state today. Sure, so Clean Router is a filtering router that filters the internet for your home. So instead of having to install software on every device in your house, um, you install the router and it filters for everything. It allows you to have time restrictions. So I have five kids. He has, my business partner has six kids. Um, in 2016, the average household right now has 16 different devices connected to the internet. So that's what parenting looks like in 2015, or 2016. So uh, we just wanted to make it simple, build a tool for parents to be able to keep track of what their kids are doing online. So it does email reports and time restrictions. So like my 15-year-old tablet turns off at nine o'clock at night, but my eight-year-old's tablet turns off at seven, that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of the, the cool. ultimate parental Wi-Fi control, so. Very cool, very cool. All right, so yeah, tell us about, so you were still um, ultimately working for a number of years after that very first um, spark. So, so tell us about those years. After we'd gotten laid off in 2009, we had the idea, we wanted to bring it to fruition, and so we started to, um, we started to build it, and we, uh, we actually both drained our 401ks. We kind of worked through 2009 to get the product built. We started selling it in 2010 and it started selling, but we figured out really fast that it wasn't gonna support us. And frankly, at that point, we couldn't afford to hire ourselves. We were both developers with like 12 years of experience at that point or 11 years of experience at that point. And, and so we, we were like, this doesn't make sense. So I started back at GoDaddy uh, as when I picked up a job at GoDaddy as a, as a developer at GoDaddy and he started at Ticketmaster. And 
Um, we started to run the company that way. And at first it was answering emails while we're at work, ducking out of work, you know, on lunches was mostly spent doing calls. Eric eventually took over most of that and I was kind of doing most of the email stuff. Um, and we did that for about a year and a half and just nights and weekends, nights and weekends, a <laughs> lot of late nights. Hats off to the, the wife in the back. Again, Absolutely. Right? Hats off to the wife back there. <laughs> Very patient. Yeah. So um, how did the product evolve over this time and how did you, um, kind of, how did you find your path to get the product right? So one of the first things that really hit us was we had, um, at the time router manufacturing, routers weren't as robust as they are now. So we were buying off the route, off the shelf kits that people would build and do like PF sense and make these inline servers that they would do that are still built on kind of a router manufacturer. And we had scrounged up some of our own money. We'd gotten a little bit of seed money originally, just a little bit of small amount of seed money um, to buy some of those initial purchases. And we found this board and it was perfect and we developed on it for about three months. We were ready to ship the product and then the perfect board hit the market. And we had this really tough decision. Do we go with the, the board that's right or this one that we had just sunk about $40,000 into inventory for? And it was really a hard decision because we didn't want to sell the wrong thing. Um, and so we made the decision ultimately and we worked out with this one distributor who would sell them to us in small enough parts that we could afford since we just spent all of our money on this other board. And we kind of just, actually my guest room was completely full of this inventory and we just kind of let it sit there for like, I don't know, three or four months. And because we started shipping this other one and we started selling them in beta, but we actually originally were just assembling all the kits ourselves. We would flash the firmware onto them and then assemble it and just sell them direct on our website. And at first we were selling about 50, 60 a month. I mean, we were, they, they actually picked up pretty quick, um, but we obviously figured it wasn't gonna support us. Um, so it was hard, it was hard to make that ultimate decision. But the funny thing about that is then about three months later, I realized, wait a minute, distributors are taking the same hardware that I'm having right now. They're marking up about 50, 60% and selling it. So we actually got um, one of our business partners that was working with us then, we did nothing but build eBay kits and listed it on eBay and that and started selling them. We marked it up for 30% over what we paid for it and started selling them on eBay on an eBay store and that actually kept us alive for the first year. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Very good. So um, how did you get that early attention of your customers? You mentioned you were selling through your website. Were there any other channels and how are you getting that word out? Um, mostly kind of started word of mouth. A lot of it was really word of mouth. We, we're product guys. So for us, like we really wanted the product to be perfect. And I think our customers could see early on that we were driving for that. We were releasing and iterating features that customers wanted. Customers would, hey, I want this, and we would fix it for them or whatever. Um, we sold it in beta for the first 18 months that we sold it. And we literally put a little beta sticker on the bottom of every single one. Was that helpful? Yeah, it was. It was. Customers were surprisingly tolerant. Um, they were surprisingly, and, and they're actually still surprisingly tolerant of we're not a multi, multi-million dollar firm, and, and, but people love the product. When it really, when a product fits, when a product has a real product fit, people will be a lot of, pay, will be really patient with a lot of little bugs, hmm. so. That's impressive. Do you think that, um, like, do you recommend, what do you recommend for people when it comes to beta? Like, how long should they keep that designation, or what's your Get opinion Get it out as that? fast as you can. Strip it down, take, I, we're big fans of the lean methodology, and especially, and we weren't perfect at this, but, I think we did pretty good at it. Um, we probably should have released three or four months earlier than we did. We went through even a couple of iterations before we did get it into customers' hands. But we got it into customers' hands as early as we possibly could, and then we iterated quickly. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the fact that um, the, the beta sticker buys you a lot of patience from customers. And again, if it's a product fit, they'll be patient with it. Um, but the sooner you can get it into customers' hands, the better. Was there anything that you learned from those early customer interactions that surprised you as opposed to your vision initially? Absolutely. There was, there was features we thought were going to be imperative that we suddenly get into customers' hands and figure out they didn't care about them, or then features that we didn't include that they're like, like time restrictions. That was one we didn't actually release with, and we figured out really fast that people being able to control their kids' time was just as important as the filtering. So we, you know, we, we iterated on that really quick, and now it's one of our really big features. Hmm. All right. So um, take us back then, so through those years, tell us, it sounds like it's about a seven year journey. Yeah. So how did the, how did the company kind of ramp up over those years? Um, i trying to remember all the numbers to the exact dates. It's been a while. Um, okay. the, uh, Just general. Um, I, we sold about a thousand of them in beta. Um, and so that was mostly all through word of mouth. Um, both my business partner and I are LDS, so we advertised in the LDS space because it's what we knew. 
Good so, social network, man. It's hard to beat that one. It is. And it is. so we advertised in those in those spaces, but on really small scale. I think those first years we were maybe spending maybe $10,000 on advertising a year, tops. It wasn't much. Um, but we just try to do our best to maximize that. Um, we're both web developers, so we tried our hardest to make sure that we were um, iterating as close as we could on the web to make sure that the website was up to date. Um, at one point, it pretty quickly turned to where Eric was driving almost entirely at just the web marketing side of things and I was mostly working on the router. He'd still work in other pieces, but that became his entire focus while I more of just kept the routers online and going. So you guys did focus on SEO and kind of all the practices to get the visibility? Yeah, absolutely. We tried to do our best at that. And again, we're, we're still working on that. <laughs> um, and, and it's one you will work on for the rest of time. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so keep going. Didn't mean to interrupt the company. So no, it's all right. We, uh, we, ramped, we ramped up to about 1,000 routers in sales. Um, you know, we were, uh, we moved past where we were building our own kits. We had now at this point started to partner with Buffalo Tech. Um, they liked us flashing our software onto their hardware and they were cool with us sticking a sticker on it and selling them. Um, and that has actually proved to be an enormous, um, an enormous change for us to move from trying to produce our own hardware to partnering where we could. Um, especially as we're in just the scrap mode of startup, um, it's, it's huge because we didn't hold the warranty, we didn't hold um, the responsibility for manufacturing. Most manufacturers won't manufacture under 2,000 parts. We were able to order, in the beginning we were ordering like 50 parts at a time and just ordering really small increments. So how did you, if, if someone else was looking at a similar situation, feeling limited by some of the constraints that they might see, like what, what are your thoughts about how to really get access in those areas like you described? Was it relationships that enabled you to really get them to do the smaller quantities? Proof or? of traction, I would say, is part of what started to that, to just be open and tell the distributors what we were doing. Um, don't be afraid of them. Like at first I was really scared. I thought none of these companies are going to want to work, for, work with us. But that's actually proved to be exactly the opposite. They don't really care who they're selling it to. <laughs> Frankly, at the end of the day, um, you know, they'll sell it to whoever's going to pay for it and use it. And they like seeing their product out there and to use too. And so um, we've really found a couple of companies who have really actually tried to fit themselves into the niche and we've become a, an example they use. So both Buffalo Tech and TP-Link both are ones that are trying to uh, really use us as an example of, hey look, people build on our hardware too. But today it's even way easier now with things like the Raspberry Pi and there's so much embedded technology now. Personally, there's, there's very few products you can't sell a thousand of built off of some existing hardware now. There's really very few things. I mean, the Raspberry Pi Zero is like a $5 device. We would have given our right arm for that when we had yeah, started. Sure. I mean, heck, I would have built those out with some USB adapters and shipped them. But anyways, the, uh, <laughs> you know, I, we, you know, it, use what you have at your hand and what you can get disposed and then push the envelope a little bit. Um, for a long time, we were shipping a unit that was only 64 megabytes of RAM. Didn't have quite the specs we should, but we made it work. Okay, so as the company is continuing to grow, now where are we at? Um, so after about 18 months, I would say one of the big pivotal points was we hired Ryan, who's here with us now, and has been pivotal in our growth um, because that has allowed us to say, Ryan, keep the customers happy. And, and that was huge for us to be able to immediately get into um, having ultimate customer support. And we've, been, we've worked really hard to continue to grow that way. Um, and Ryan was awesome in... We, we handed them our outer, we spent about an hour with them, we said, good luck. And uh, we said, let us know if there's problems, let us know when the customers are complaining. And, uh, we, and a lot of that time, we, he couldn't even get a hold of us during the day, so he was truly all by himself, because we were working day jobs. And so, um, anyways, that, we, that was a big shift for us. And from there, we started to really grow. Between that and partnering with the hardware, we really started to grow. Um, by 2000, and, um, so I don't know how fast you want me to go That's through it, but, the, good, yeah. but we, we, we continued to grow and there was a lot of different hurdles along the way, um, tons of different unforeseen things. Um, at one point we were just about to pull the trigger to manufacture our own hardware. And ultimately the reason we didn't is because um, the manufacturing agent of ours in China disappeared with $40,000 of our money. Oh man, these so things happen. There are those kind of nights. Like Forty is an unlucky yeah, number for you. Yeah, I guess. Just put that um, out there. For real. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna avoid anything that's about forty thousand yeah. um, dollars. We're uh, you know, but it was it was one of those moments where Eric and I were sitting together. It was about three o'clock in the morning. We were both working day jobs, and it was one of those moments where we looked at each other and kind of said, "Is this worth it?" 
right, is this really, I mean, at this point, as we continue to build the company, one of the things that Eric and I vowed right from the start is we weren't going to take money until they're out of the company until there was money to take. And that's part of the reason we continued to work day jobs. It's just we, everything went right back into the company. Um, and so there was a lot of moments like that where we looked at each other and just said, How did you keep the drive to keep going? Um, we were really passionate about the product. We're parents. Um, I remember one particular night we were actually doing a database cutover and the other person who was working on it had to leave and I, it was about 3.30 in the morning and I had just finished this database conversion um, and we were, and I, and I was just sitting there and it was, and it was like, and I was exhausted. I knew I had to get up for work in like two hours to get to work and I ran, it was in the middle of what I was doing, I ran a query and I saw that there was almost 4,000 routers that were online. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm helping 4,000 families right now keep their kids safe online. And it was just one of those moments where I'm like, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And, and you know, it was a lot of nights like that where we saw a lot of people, um, honestly, we had a lot of people come to us in tears, thank you for doing this. We were, you know, we had, the, you know, our son was addicted to pornography and, we're, and we, we didn't know what to do. You know, we were either gonna cancel the internet or else we found your product and, you know, and it, was those kind of things that kept us going forward. Pretty cool. So 4,000 routers, about how long ago was that? So um, in the beginning of 2015, we actually were about at about 5,000 routers. Um, and that was actually when I met you. Um, and that's kind of a cool story. I like that part of the story. But my, uh, my nephew came to town, or uh, sorry, my cousin came to town. And he's an entrepreneur. And he was like, so what kind of meetups are you going to then? And I was still doing the you know full-time day job and working on Clean Router. And, I was like, well, first thing he said, how many customers do you guys have? And I was like, well, we're you know, a little over 5,000. He's like, what? You guys have 5,000? That's amazing. And we had kind of this romantic idea that a successful startup was hundreds of thousands of customers and millions of dollars of revenue. And, and, uh, and he was like, wow, that's amazing. So what kind of meetups are you going to? And I'm like, I don't think I've ever gone to one before. And he's like, well, let's start, let's start looking then. Okay, let's, uh, what, let's get on your LinkedIn. I'm like, I don't have a LinkedIn profile. He was like, what are you doing? And so he actually, that night, he and I were sitting there and we were digging through the internet and I found your Meet Me, or uh, your Meet Me pages, right? Launch Me, yeah. Launch Me, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I found that and I was like, Christy Kerner offers like 45 minutes of free consulting. Ah, let's try this. And so I signed up and, and I talked with Christy and Christy was like, um, okay, I got to introduce you to some people. <laughs> and uh, Seriously. That Beyond next Tuesday. Just idea, this guy had traction. That's no small thing. Well, and the next Tuesday was the startup grind, and I came, and Greg head spoke, I still remember. Um, and it was, uh, and I started to just get to know people, and I actually met um, Jonathan Ariano at that, and they've been really instrumental in helping us um, yeah. shape ourselves and get looking like a real company, and, and you know, some of those kind of changes. That you have I was to going mild on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. And yep. then, uh, what was it like six weeks later that you went to Startup Week? I did. I went. I so well. I, yeah, six eight weeks later, I you were like, "There's this Startup Week thing. I don't know." And luckily with GoDaddy, we have lots of vacations, so I took the whole week off and brought my laptop. So I'm just going to work all week while I was there, and it just absolutely inspired me. And I was like, "I've got to make this work." I, I was listening to everybody else's stories, and I'm like, "Man, this thing we have is way bigger than I thought it was." And because we saw the day to day, we saw the grind, we saw the struggle, we saw how our product still wasn't perfect in our eyes. And we, and, and so we didn't see the successes. It was really too easy to, it's, it gets so easy when you're in the grind to see all the problems that you have and how you're not perfect to see your own successes. And so Startup Week really helped me with that. It really helped me to see holy smokes, there's this, this, and this we can change, but we're doing pretty good so far. So it was really inspiring. And I, and I, Got on the phone with Eric on like Wednesday of that week. I'm like, Eric, I'm quitting my job. I'm gonna quit it in May. I think that was when we started like January. Can you call February. Eric or your wife first? I'm just curious. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. I don't know. I probably told my wife first, but let's go with that. I'm gonna guess. I got. I'm gonna. I'm gonna guess that I had her permission before I made that decision. But yeah. Um, no, and she was, and she was super encouraging to that too. And that's one of the things that she believes in the mission too. In fact. Um, for over half the time, she's actually done all of our setup and shipping, and she still is today. So, wow. I mean, props to an amazing, awesome, supportive wife who has yeah. been tolerant through the whole thing and who has absolutely seen the vision more than I do some days. And that's, that's huge. Do you ever put the kids to work? 
Oh heck yeah, okay. heck yeah! They're they're constantly doing stuff. They're assembling boxes. They're oh yeah, absolutely. No, they do stuff all the time. And in fact, it's hilarious because they wear clean router shirts all the time. And my son just came home from school yesterday because they just started back to school a couple weeks ago. And so I think it was one of the first time he wore a shirt this year. And he's like, Dad, all the kids kept asking me what clean router is, and I told them that it. It's something you put in your house to make sure you don't look at bad things on the internet. I'm like, that's pretty good. That is good. <laughs> that's pretty good business description that right there. That is good. So then tell us, um, so I think you are an interesting um, example in my eyes because it's hard sometimes, uh, there was even talk on social media a little bit this week about why it's important to engage in the community as a startup. You know, what what is it about like showing up and talking to other people? Um, how does that enhance things? Because it's it's qualitative thing it's not quantitative you totally know? so the past year and a half as you've gotten more engaged what how does that affect your business and how did that affect you and tell us it, more about that I, I mean it's affected us a ton I mean from um, I mean the people first of all I was terrified to go out and talk to people because I thought everybody was gonna be like you guys don't have a real business you guys don't know what you're doing and just kind of look down their noses I've been blown away at how much everybody is supportive how much everybody's just trying to help you out. You know, you thought it was, I don't want to talk about my idea, somebody might steal it, somebody might, somebody might think it's dumb. It doesn't matter. Everybody has been so supportive and so cool about it. Um, but not only that, as soon as I, one of the first things that I remember Jonathan Ariano said is he said, you need to get out there and you need to network like you can't even imagine. So I set a goal that in 2015 I was going to have a meeting with at least 100 people. And, um, and I hit that goal. And it has proved to be awesome. And one of the things I've tried to do is every time I sit down with somebody, I try to bring at least anywhere from one to three questions that I've researched this person and then said, what can this person help me with? And every single time this person has given great advice, great. I, I've learned how to be a CEO. I've completely changed over the last 18 months on, on how I'm rolling as a CEO um, from the advice that I've got from these people, from the, the lessons that I've learned. If you go to Startup Week, and, and truly both times, and I will probably forever do this, I block off the entire week, and I'm usually there with a laptop working still, but I, I'm there and I'm listening and I'm learning because people are so willing to help in whatever ways they can. And it has been, it's, it's inspiring. It is truly, um, all the knowledge you need is here. Um, and, and not even that, but now it's even given introductions as we start to go into this next phase and even as we, are starting to talk to investors and maybe move into that those kind of directions. Even those connections have just started to fall in our lap just because of how awesome this community is. It's true. You know, it's interesting to me. It used to really bother me that it felt like um, so much in business is relationship based. You know, it's it's if they if you know them, they know you. But really, when you stand back and think about it, anybody can access or build those relationships just like you did. And um, having your reputation precede you, especially if you're getting closer to investment times. Yes. It's no bad thing, for sure. Absolutely, but I mean, you know, guys like Zach, you, I mean, you guys that are these these cornerstones, um, um, Jonathan Cottrell, I mean, all these kind of guys, and every single one of them are totally happy to make these um, these introductions. And as I start to talk and you talk to other people, I, I mean, heck, just even at the last social, you know, we're at a point now where we're starting to try to find a business development manager to kind of help. One of the things Eric and I have found is we're really good at building a product kind of bad at running a business. I mean, we're, we're okay, we've learned how to hack it together, but it's not our for, forte. So just even at the, at the social, I just, I, I started to talk to people and we already made a connection and actually have since made a hire based on a referral just that was given that night. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. People are really what make the world go round at the end of the day. Totally. So speaking of hacking, um, tell us a little bit about your perspective on just what it means to be an entrepreneur and how, like, what it means to continually just have to figure that out. You know, being an entrepreneur, you have to, when you first start, you have to wear every single hat. And that means you gotta figure it out. And it drives my family crazy sometimes, but I'm a firm believer that somebody else figured out how it works, so can I. And with the resources that people have available to them now, jump in and figure it out. You're no, I guarantee you, you're not gonna do it right the first time. Like, just guaranteed. But you gotta take the failure, learn from it, and instead of beating yourself up and saying, man, why did I do that? Or why did I make the mistake? You say, hey, the good news on this one is this. In fact, I think I just sent an email last night that I'd made this bad blunder in our, in our subscription system. And the email was actually all full of the good news is this, the bad news is this. So we already tried to find, hey, we don't want to make this mistake again, but this is the good thing that happened because of it. So um, I'm just a huge believer in we all make mistakes. We all hack it together. 
just I, I believe that you can hack together anything you want and luckily two hackers have proved that we can hack together a business too. <laughs> Very cool. Now you guys actually um, have always had the hardware component and then you've added kind of a SaaS product on top of that now. So um, you know Mario Martinez quoted someone so this is like a third layer <laughs> quote here and I have no idea where the original source is but it was something about how really growing a business is like working with a Rubik's Cube because you just constantly are sorting and twisting and turning and you get it to that spot where like everything is green but one freaking red one in the middle and you're like, damn it, right? So what is it, what has it been like for you um, figuring out how to have a SaaS model as, as a part of the business and then just figuring out where your business is going to go next? Yeah, absolutely. it's, you know, so last August, so a year ago now, we made the decision that, and it truly was just on this lean model, we said, tons of people have been kind of coming out for the last couple of years from a business perspective and we'd always price the product where we wanted it as consumers and we were selling it for we'd sell the unit and then charge 20 bucks a year which is like just giving it away and then last August we decided you know what we're gonna drop our prices a bit start playing with pricing and try a monthly and truly the first month was a let's see if it sticks just it was and we tried 20 bucks a month and like our sales went up that month. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Which is crazy. We, well, we changed our revenue model by almost 10x and it, our sales went up and we're like, what? And they wow. did eventually dip back down a little bit over time um, by that, but still on a 10x revenue change, it was totally yeah. worth it. And so now we're, you know, now we're cruising along and now it looks very different. We'd applied at the AIC, we'd applied at Venture Madness and it was always, yeah, that's good, but you're, we always got a lot of stuff about our revenue. Well, suddenly there was a lot of excitement about our revenue mm -hmm. and to see that, whoa, we're still selling the same, you know, about the same pace, but now it's monthly and it totally changed. And now we've even taken, uh, we actually just released mobile apps, which allow you to then do controls from parents' phones and then mobile, so it'll filter on kids' phones too. But that's the feature that our annual customers have to switch to monthly oh, for monthly. now. So Very now nice. we've found a way to even pivot our previous success and turn it into gold a little bit. Has, uh, who's heard of the AIC? <laughs> if you have it, you should go look it up right now. So tell them what it is and what that process was like and how that worked out. Sure. So the AIC, and actually this is a, a, a I'll, I'll talk on how it helped us too, because the AIC is the Arizona Innovation Challenge. And it's basically where the Arizona Commerce Authority um, provides a million and a half dollars worth of non-dilutive grant every six months. A um, bunch of companies apply, I think it was like 109 companies this time around, somewhere around there, um, that applied in spring. Um, the way it works is you, it's a two-page application, you submit it, um, five judges judge the first round, then based on the score of that, the top 25% go on to the semifinals, eight judges judge it there, and then uh, if you get picked, the top 10 companies out of the semifinals then go on to do a live like Shark, style, Shark Tank style pitch, um, where you go and do your pitch in front of a live board, and then six companies win the uh, 250,000 non-dilutive grant. Um, one of the things I really love about the AIC is one, as we started to fill out the application the first time, we were like, what is it? why are they asking that question? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. and, and guess what? The questions do make sense. There's a reason they're asking those questions. And one of the cool things about the AIC is that after your first round, of course, we failed phenomenally our first round. Most and, do. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and the, but we, they give you coaching. So you go in and, and you should absolutely, if you haven't, you should absolutely go take advantage of the coaching. And they'll, they coach you through. So we got really lucky and the second time we applied, we got into the top 20, or no, we, just, we were just outside the top 25. So I went to my coaching and I got Jim Golka as my coach, which was just awesome. That's awesome. Um, it is awesome. And, and Jim was super, super complimentary again, which bolstered my um, confidence a little bit to be like, wait, Jim thinks this is awesome, you know? And he was really excited and talked about his former success in content filtering. Oh, um, that was actually that. his first exit was selling wow. a content filtering company at Apple. That's cool. um, and then he, um, he was super complimentary, gave some very specific pointed advice. And we then applied it, took that application again. So each time we're getting it better and better. And then this last time we made it all the way through and won the grant. So we're pretty, Super cool. we're pretty excited about that. But the big thing about that is take those opportunities one, because it will tell you things your business needs to do. And a lot of the changes we've made have been by going through the processes of Venture Madness and the AIC applications to really learn, oh, this is what a company should look like. 
and, 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 and we tried to take that counsel as much as we could and apply it. So I would definitely say that's a big part of the AIC. Sure. Very cool. We actually have another winner in the house today. Yeah. Sydney Peck over there from Smart Brain Aging, who has a company that helps those in the dementia space, also won this round. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing I just always like to highlight a little bit is that Arizona does have an amazing amount of resources available. So um, Venture Madness, the other one you referenced, the application for that is going to be starting here in a couple months. So if you are a startup, make sure and go to VentureMadness.com because you want to be up on that. They, they, pit, they pit the top 64 startups in the Southwest against each other, like bracketology style. And um, whether or not you actually win, uh, the visibility you get and the connections you get and the experience and the training and the mentoring and all that is so valuable. And, so. and you should definitely go even if you don't win. It's the true. first time we made it into the top it's 64 and I went to all three of them and again, same thing. On each time you watch the pitch, one, you're learning about good pitches. So you're seeing, dude, I would never invest in that product. I would invest in that product, <laughs> right? Seriously. Right. But then secondly, what kind of questions are those judges asking? What kind of criticisms and critiques are they giving? And if you're not sitting there taking notes on that, then you're silly because you should. Because I mean, <laughs> sure. that's that's those are some of the biggest names in the entire entrepreneurial space are at those events. It's totally true, and I think that's a differentiator too. Is that um, some people that want to try entrepreneurship that sit back and wait for a mentor program to be available to them or for something to just come to them, as opposed to those that get out there and find it and access it. It's all there, and you're a great example of someone that went out and found it and made it happen. So. Well, it's there. Go get it. Like you said, don't mm -hmm. wait for it, because it's there. It's not as, I, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, you can jump into some of these incubators or stuff like that, but the thing about mm -hmm. it is that at the end of the day, those same resources are all available to you for free. That's true. Huh? <laughs> That's true. Very good. All right, so um, before, we will have time for Q&A for the audience in just a minute here, um, but before we do that, any, any last thoughts or any last parts of anything that you want to cover? And before we do q and I have a 20 questions game okay. for you as well. Um, I, just the first thing I'd say is jump in and do it. Just do it. I think probably the biggest regret that I have is I didn't quit my job two years earlier. Sure. Um, you know, and now in hindsight, you know, and I don't have big regrets, but that and just uh, trust people. There's a lot of people in this in this space who are so nice and so willing to help, and they won't look down their nose at you, and they'll do everything. But make sure you're learnable and teachable, and listen to their advice because there's a lot of really smart people with a lot of really good ideas. It's true. I like it. I don't know if every community is this way. I hope they are, but in Phoenix, we have something good going. So absolutely. Very cool. All right, so our final little get to know you thing here before right. we open it up to the audience so you guys have a couple minutes to think if you have questions. Um, so just tell me your first answer, whatever comes to your head. Okay. Number one, cats or dogs? Dogs. Beer or wine? Root beer. <laughs> That's right, I forgot. <laughs> Sushi or tacos? Uh, sorry, what was the first one? Sushi Oh. or tacos? Definitely tacos, I'm not a sushi guy. <laughs> All right, um, a favorite app? You can't say yours. Oh, yeah, count. no, it doesn't count. <laughs> um, what favorite one or the one I use the most? <laughs> well, tell us both. Well, now we're uh, interested. Well, the one I use the most is probably Gmail, unfortunately. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure. just in and out of it. Um, probably my favorite. Uh, my favorite one is actually used to be XBMC and now it's Cody. I'm a huge media freak and I love hacking, so it kind of just goes with my nature. But. Okay, very good. Favorite operating system? It's Linux now. Wow, I don't think anyone has said that to oh, me before. Okay. It's well. impressive. Favorite holiday? Um, Christmas. I Fav love spending Christmas with my kids. Sure. Favorite car? I don't know. I, had, um, I got to drive my brother's M3 once. It was a lot of fun. Very good. Favorite vacation spot? Um, probably in the mountains. Just anywhere up in the mountains where there's pine trees. Feels like home. I like the yeah, cool weather. Still can. Yep. Yep. Favorite book. Favorite book. Um, I grew up on the Pride Inc. Chronicles, and it's all about a kid who hacked together his life and figured it out. It's like the Black Cauldron series, but this is a theme. It is. All right. Uh, favorite movie or TV show? Um, favorite movies. I love the Jason Bourne series. Did you see the new one that just came I out? I did. Okay. It was good. It wasn't quite as good as the originals, but yeah, it was good. Yeah. Uh, favorite artist, like musician? Um, U2. I love U2. I thought you said YouTube. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah, that's a weird artist. No, U2. All right. 
Your go-to karaoke song. Uh, um, actually, it would be um, Santa Fe by, on, from the Newsies soundtrack. <laughs> okay, anyone know what Newsies is? Anybody know Newsies? All right. All right, we got two. All right, all right. It's like true confession time. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> I grew up on that, so that's like, <laughs> I like it. yeah. Very good. Anything you collect? <laughs> um, <laughs> hardware. <laughs> I just have so much hacked hardware sitting on my shelf at home. <laughs> Any unusual skills or talents? Hmm. I would see if Carson was going to give me, any, my wife was going to give me any uh, hints. <laughs> um, I don't know, just a general persistence. I work way too hard. Your, your top strength in business? Probably persistence. What profession, other than those that you've tried, would you like to attempt? Um, I would love to teach. I, if I, I would love to teach. It just, I love, I love helping minds figure things out. It's fun to me. What is the best compliment someone can give you? That I'm a good father. What is a cause that you are passionate about? Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about the fight against pornography. I think it's, I think we have teenagers that are growing up um, learning about sex from pornography and I don't think, I think it's a social experiment that I don't think we even know how bad it's gonna be 20 years from now. One thing on your bucket list. Hmm, one thing on my bucket list, sell a company. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> that works, that works, very good. All right, so we'll take some questions from the audience. So, anyone have a question? This always happens. Okay, good. I was going to say, I was going to be all nervous. I've got a question on the packaging. So how did sure. You We so don't for the video. We'll kind of repeat the question a little sure. bit. Sure. So, so you, you asked about packaging and how we de what we decided to do for packaging and how important that was. We made the decision really early on. We weren't going to target going after a store shelf. The margins are really low. The complication is really high. So because of we're direct sales to the website, really our packaging that matters the most is the website, and that's why Eric has gone through how many iterations of the website? At least a solid five iterations of the website over the years. But the box itself, we actually just buy from Uline, oh. and we ship in a white box with a with a clean router sticker on it. Oh, nice. Because at the end of the day, at that point, we've made the sale, and they're more concerned with, I mean, kind of to another aspect of that question, we spent a lot of time in the beginning trying to manufacture our own cases for the router, thinking everybody really cared what the case looked like. But routers aren't iPads at the end of the day, and people didn't really care what it looked like, they cared what it, how it worked. Right. And so we ended up spending a lot of time and energy on that that didn't really produce. So we ship in a white box and we put a sticker on it on somebody else's product, and people have zero complaints with that. Cool. All right, thank you. So I just learned about Clean Router today, and everything you're doing is fascinating to me. I have a very limited knowledge of routers, but everything you're doing sounds like it shouldn't work in theory okay. at all. <laughs> So uh, the first big curiosity for me is how you even got to the point where you were just hacking other companies' technology and they were okay with it after they learned about what you were doing. Like, did you approach them and say, hey, this is what we're doing? Or were you just selling these things, they found out and they were like, oh, this is cool, maybe we'll get a cut, something like that. How do they support you with what you're doing now? So the, the question, just to repeat for the video, is uh, you know, how did we approach the, the hardware manufacturers and how did we tell them what we were doing and how did we kind of get to the point where we have the partnerships we have now? Is that good? Okay, so the, uh, first of all, we, we at first, we started buying units that didn't even have any firmware on them. So we were flashing our own and when we, when we launched, that's how we were. So kind of think Raspberry Pi of sorts, but for routers. Um, people who use these, uh, there's uh, some manufacturers called Alix, um, uh, Ubiquity sold stuff for a while that you know didn't have any uh, OS's on them or minimal OS. Um, we actually are built on top of OpenWRT, which is a, a distribution of Linux for routers specifically. Um, and so uh, when we when we started branching into the concept of partnering with Buffalo Tech was the first one that we did. We were really upfront with them. We said, "This is what we're doing. This is what we're going to do with your hardware. We're going to put a sticker on it that has ours." And we originally were like, well, we promise we'll leave your name on there. And frankly, they didn't care. They didn't even care if we were covering their name or not. At the end of the day, they actually wanted um, to be branded as we're people who are supportive of other people building on our hardware. 
Um, and both Buffalo Tech and TP-Link actually both pride themselves in that. TP-Link lately has gotten in trouble with the FCC on some of that, but Buffalo Tech actually just reached out to us again about a month ago and really wants us to come back to their hardware again. Um, I think partly also they're interested in seeing somebody build a SaaS-based company on top of their router, and they're watching very closely. They keep a very close eye on what our numbers are, how many we're buying, et cetera. Does that kind of help? Or yeah. I, my, my advice, if I can give one piece of advice with, if you're anywhere near something like that, is just be honest. These, most companies, especially if they're running anything that will run on open source software, know that that's what people are doing with it. So they actually want that customer base. Um, two questions. How long um, did you have the idea uh, before you acted on it? And who's your About an hour. <laughs> uh, so how long, so the first question was how long did we have the idea before we acted on it? I said about an hour because truly, and my wife will attest to this, once I get an idea in my head I don't really let go and I will truly work night and day until I figure it out. And I, I, I literally started, I think that day we started talking about it we said we got to put this in the router, you know, it's where this belongs, it's, it shouldn't be software, it should be a hardware based approach. And I started hacking, literally I just, what can I get that'll run Linux? And you know, we just we start hacking on it. So truly, like started right from the minute. Uh, what was your second question? I forgot. Who's your biggest competitor? Um, so our largest competitor just came out last November. They were a failed Kickstarter uh, project by the name of Circle, um, and they actually got a content partnership with Disney. Um, so Disney's now funding them. Um, they're a little small device. They tout that they have parental controls, but the filtering comparison is really night and day. Um, they basically mostly focus on like time restrictions for your kids. Um, for a long time they were iOS only. They just started releasing some Android stuff, but again, it's working on a weird technology. And um, so anyways, that's our largest competitor to date. So is your demographic primarily you know, families or parents? So our target demographic for advertising is women ages 25 to 55. I can tell you this because we've really started to narrow it down as we've started to hit demographics with kids. But we have about 10 to 15% of our customers that are actually grandparents who buy it because they don't know how to keep up with their grandkids. And their grandkids bring stuff over and they're like, what are they doing on the internet? And so actually a lot of grandparents buy it. Um, and then we also do have a lot of single men who struggle with pornography addictions um, that use it as an accountability tool and other things. So, um, but definitely our target primary audience is 20, women 25 to 55 with kids. All right. And so those people I'm guessing don't have a lot of knowledge of technologies maybe in the wireless space or internet in general. So yep. how do you sell them on a SaaS model specifically? Because I'm sure they're not familiar with even that model, if I guess. Awesome support. That's one of the biggest things is these people know that it's super easy to use, but they still want help and they still want that peace of mind knowing they can get help. And so by providing awesome support, that's really, and actually to your point of the competitor, Circle has zero support. You can't even email them, let alone call them. We provide guys from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to 5 on Saturday. And these are, these are Arizona bodies. These are technical support guys that are good and they'll help you with anything. And that's really the biggest differentiator. But at the end of the day, um, we're constantly keeping up with it and people understand that's not a model that it's not a product you buy and just leave on the shelf you know the internet's changing every single day and people understand that that takes a lot of development on the back end do you work with schools or any kind of public system like so libraries? we've really resisted getting into the small to medium business space um, we have it's a really hard shiny object because the margins are so high in it but right now we're really working on just staying focused uh, as, as Greg Head would say, focus to growth. Stay focused, nail that market. In fact, I met with Greg about um, six weeks ago and he just pounded that right back into my head again. Pick a demographic, really narrow that demographic to a very specific space and then become the best at that demographic and nail it. So we've actually tried to stay away from those. We do have a lot of businesses that buy them and use them. We have a couple of car dealerships that call up and they'll be like, oh, it crashed today. And we'll get on and be like, you had 80 people connect to it today. That's a little outside of residential scope. But so, um, you know, we've always toyed with the idea of building, uh, spreading into more of a SMB, but we've kind of resisted against the lure of that. All right, we'll do two more questions. Is your your uh, mobile app, is it free or do you charge? 
So the model that we've set up, and we've played a lot with pricing this year, the model that we have set up right now is that you can get the router-based filtering for $12.99 a month, or else if you want the addition of the mobile apps, then it bumps your subscription to $20 a month, but then you can connect as many devices. But the way that it's set up is, like you wouldn't connect your friend's devices because you'll be getting all the reports and that kind of stuff. So it, it's really pretty specific that it's to your house. Um, but it's, uh, we have some really cool patent pending technology in the way that we do the messaging back and forth. And it's pretty slick because you can, as a parent, pull open your app and say, I'm going to turn off Billy's internet right now. And no matter where you are, his internet goes off. And then it'll follow him even on his mobile device. Was it the customer that drove that, the apps, or was yeah. it your idea to... It was really, the, I would say that's the customer growth. That was really a lot of the customers saying, we want this, when are you gonna get this on? You know, my kids got, during the six years that we've been doing this, you know, I mean, we bought our first smartphones actually as our first company phones in 2000, and, end of 2010, I think, when we first bought our first smartphones. And so smartphones were brand new when we started this, but since then, the median age of kids that are walking around with smartphones is just plummeting like a rock. So it was kind of a, nece a necessity to keep the business alive too. I mean, not that it was hurting, people know they still need to secure a home, but it's a huge customer demand. Makes sense. Um, well, we'll we get ready for the last question. Would you guys get the raffle snuff? Um, and then we'll do that real quick here. And if you wouldn't mind, sorry, my purse in the other room has a gift card. Sorry, sorry, last question. Are you a bootstrapped company or did you raise any funds? So we had a very little amount of seed funding that helped us buy that first initial order of, of hardware and then we've bootstrapped all along since. Um, the AIC is actually the first large outside funding that we will take in. And seed was like angel investment or is it the Yeah, it was some friends and family money. We can do one more. Here okay. Oh, I just want to uh, mention about you, met, uh, you talked about this time restriction feature. Uh -huh. And you said that by accident, you, fed, uh, you kind of connect with that. I actually have a personal story because my husband actually a couple years ago and I set the router with time restriction. And it's purpose actually for me because I tend to work overnight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, your husband yeah. limited your That's time. Awesome. <laughs> so That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, but he didn't put it into the business. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, what's your suggestion or advice to the, uh, the potential, like the people who have uh, lots of ideas? Because I tend to be a creative. So when I have uh, lots of ideas, it's hard for me to pick and choose. So I tend to go into the rabbit holes, right? And then, well, and then I'm an engineer, I'm a data scientist. I, okay. know, I like to hands on, you know, playground but I lack of some of the uh, uh, vet or the business or the customers. So that piece, I feel like I'm pursuing a certain perfection, which is, may not be helpful. Okay. And how do you, uh, how do you aim low, right? And how do you aim low, like, like you say, lane or age out, whatever way, but get close to the people who has experience and, and get that connection going on, right? Sure. So I'd say uh, there's kind of three things and I'll hit all of them really quick. Gary V at, um, at uh, Venture Madness this last year said, first of all, being the CEO and starting your own company is not for everybody. Being somebody's number two or number three is a huge success. And sometimes if you're one of those really creative types, but you may not necessarily have the focus to execute, be okay with being somebody's two or three and go help that person build something really cool. So that'd be my first piece. And that just comes from what Gary Vee was saying. My other piece says, if you're gonna pick one of them and go for it, which one has the best market fit? Pick, solve a real problem. Sometimes I hear entrepreneurs that come to me and I'll say, and I'll be like, I don't know if anybody would buy that. You know, go with something that you think is going to be. What is the re the biggest problem that you have to solve? Um, don't necessarily. There's very few people who can successfully create the problem, in my opinion. Solve a real problem. Go for it. And then lastly. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of lean model and iterate quickly. Um, Brett Larson's one who is um, who is now one of our um, advisors, and he's he's a huge one to say, put it out there, go build a website, right? Use Weebly, use something, plug some analytics into it, and go build a website. So if you've got ten ideas, go build ten websites. Might take ten weekends, but go build ten websites. Track and analyze. See which one gets you the best cost of acquisition on each one and just do as a sign up. Like, are you interested in this? You know, sign up for the newsletter. See how many of them sign people up using the exact same budget across each of them. Doesn't take a lot of knowledge, a lot of know-how. You should be able to put that together with a Weebly page, some Google Analytics, we're talking about mostly free tools. And go try them out, see which one bites the most. Whichever one gets the most bites, run with that one. 
She's data analytics girl, so exactly. that's really Ex exactly. language right there. Exactly, so, so you should be all over that. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Spencer. Thank Seriously. you. Appreciate it. It's been it. amazing. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It.